Welcome to this video on the use of the husk of psyllium, Plantago ovata. I'm Guy Daniels, the microbiome expert. Psyllium is not exactly a sexy topic, but can come in quite handy. Psyllium is both a fiber and a prebiotic. Fiber we think of as a bulking agent, which is certainly a part of its appeal. Its appeal is also the fact that it contains mucilaginous properties, in other words, gut-soothing properties like DGL, marshmallow root, or slippery elm. But psyllium is also a prebiotic. Now, the accepted definition of a prebiotic is actually a bit incorrect, but we'll go with the general idea of it, which is that it feeds health-promoting bacteria. If you're new, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also follow me on Instagram and Facebook as The Microbiome Expert. But psyllium is a bit different from the other prebiotics for which I have educational videos. Inulin, pectin, resistant starch, beta-glucan, and arabinoxylin. Feel free to watch them. Speaking of arabinoxylins, the main prebiotic sugars in psyllium are arabinose and xylose which is where arabinoxylin gets its name. So my video on arabinoxylins has relevance as to the bacteria feeding capacity of psyllium. But unlike all the other prebiotics which I just mentioned, which are basically all 100% fermentable, psyllium is less than half. The numbers vary, but the point is that the microbiome doesn't have the accessibility to these prebiotics as extensively as it does for the other prebiotics. And, if you're familiar with my videos, I'm all about feeding the good guys. But as you will soon see, psyllium will feed the good guys as well and offer other benefits. Now, when we think of psyllium, constipation usually comes to mind. And we'll get into that in a second. But here in Table 2, you can see where it has been studied with success in a broad array of conditions. Here, primarily related to parameters of metabolic syndrome. This is not shocking once you understand the connection of the gut health to your overall health. I have hours of videos on this. You can take a minute to read their comments here. Now let's get to what most everyone has probably tried psyllium for at some point, constipation. Chronic constipation is estimated to affect 12% of adults. That's tens of millions of people, and I'm helping as many as I can. My constipation protocol is one of my most popular ones. And in my consultations, I would say at least half of the time during my hour-long intake, constipation is a complaint. In figure three of this meta-analysis, they compared the effects of different prebiotics on constipation, and psyllium was shown to drive a significant benefit. Now, I never recommend just one prebiotic, usually four to five, depending on the needs of the individual. But clearly psyllium can be a part of this equation. And here we have an interesting study in constipated subjects with GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. The researchers compared the impact of the popular PPI omeprazole to psyllium. As a side note, PPIs are terrible for your microbiome. If you take them or have taken them chronically, you should watch my video on this topic. Now in table one, we're looking at the response rate and the recurrence rate. As for the initial response, both scored quite high. The PPI score was much higher than in other studies, which show much lower response rates. But the difference was in the recurrence rate. They looked at this because recurrence of GERD after PPI use is quite high, 72% in at least one study. Why? Because they treat symptoms and don't address the root cause. In any event, in our study here, the rate of recurrence for meprazole was 70%, which for psyllium, it was 24%. That's a big difference. The mechanism of action for psyllium here was probably from multiple angles, that of soothing the gut, increasing gut motility, and altering the microbiome. In all likelihood, more needs to be addressed, but that depends on the individual patient. Here we have a study on IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. IBS affects some roughly 10% of the general population. But these numbers make no sense because IBS consists of constipation, diarrhea, and a mix of the two. So if constipation was 12%, then IBS should be higher. The bottom line is that regardless of how the gut symptom is coded, GI problems are rampant. Due to a variety of factors to include excessive antibiotic use, 
the aforementioned PPIs, stress, and more. In this figure, we see constipation graft. The use of psyllium significantly reduced gut transit time. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. Now, interestingly enough, psyllium can also help in diarrhea, the other end of the spectrum in IBS. In this study, we have pediatric IBS subjects, where you can see in figure three, after four weeks of treatment, the levels of remission and mild cases were dramatically higher in the psyllium group as compared to placebo. And the remission rate in each subgroup was also comparable. That is diarrhea IBS, constipation IBS, and mixed IBS. And of course, this is not the only study to show this. Again, psyllium has a water-holding, gel-forming, mucilaginous effect. But remember, it also feeds the microbiome. If we take a look at the average microbiome profile for IBS, which comes from my IBS videos, information you'll find nowhere else, we see many of the usual key players in the microbiome. At the opposite ends of the spectrum, we see the superhero of the microbiome, F. prausitzii, always significantly higher in healthy controls as compared to those with IBS. I have a whole video dedicated to this amazing bacterium. We also see the classic opportunistic pathogen, E. coli, almost always significantly higher in those with IBS as compared to healthy controls. A good video explaining its actions is this. And just to note for my new viewers, here we see lactobacillus most of the time when a significant difference was found in the fecal microbiome of IBS subjects versus healthy controls, the abundance of lactobacillus was significantly higher in those with IBS. So why would you want to add more to this equation? See these videos for much more information. In this paper of the changes that psyllium drove in the gut microbiome as compared to placebo were significant increases in the very important families Ruminococcus and Enterobacteriaceae. Enterobacteriaceae is, as I always say, the last family you want high levels of in the body. The poster child for this family is E. coli, which you know well and we just saw. As for Ruminococcusiae, that's where our superhero resides, along with a slew of other butyrate-producing, health-promoting species from the diagram you see here. This slide is my collection of the true health-promoting bacteria in the microbiome. I've compiled this information after many thousands of hours of work as the former director of medical education for a microbiome firm and now with my own platform. These are the true health promoters of the microbiome. And in this paper, we can see not only a significant increase in the abundance of F. prausitzii with psyllium, but also a significant increase in another valuable health-promoting genus, Lachnospira. We also see Lachnospira significantly increased here in IBD, subjects who consume psyllium. Lachnospira is another of those health-promoting, butyrate-producing genera. And not too long ago, the amazing health-promoting species, E. elegans, was reclassified into Lachnospira. When we group the historical data for Lachnospira with E. elegans, we get this beautiful profile. Across the bottom in the x-axis, we see many diseases slash conditions for which I did a comprehensive meta-analysis of the human microbiome data. Green indicates the number of studies which showed significantly more Lachnospira in the healthy controls, while orange indicates when it was significantly higher in those with a given condition. As you can see, the vast majority of the time, Lachnospira is significantly higher in healthy controls. We can add to that data with my recent video on chronic kidney disease, where this meta-analysis also shows Lachnospira is almost always significantly higher in healthy controls as compared to those with kidney disease. Or from an even more recent video on UTIs, we see Lachnospira was significantly higher in healthy controls again, versus those with recurrent UTIs. So clearly the feeding of F. prausitzii and Lachnospira with the use of psyllium is one of the clear driving factors behind its benefit. Now, a couple of notes of caution with psyllium. First, one needs to consume plenty of water with it as this paper goes on to state. And others talk of esophageal obstruction, 
helio obstruction, and more. Second, when mixing it, it gels very quickly, so consume immediately after mixing. A last consideration is many of you have already tried psyllium and had mixed success. Trust me, I've heard that before. When one is dysbiotic, we need to address the microbiome from multiple angles. Your microbiome has taken hits over the years, likely from excessive antibiotic use, perhaps a poor diet, chronic stress, excessive PPI use, alcoholism, and more. I address dysbiosis from multiple angles at the same time. Psyllium alone won't do the trick, and it may not be a good choice for you anyhow. During a consultation, I'll put together a protocol which suits your specific needs. If you opt not for a consultation, then I have protocols designed to address the needs of the average microbiome of a given condition. Either way, you'll likely be uncomfortable in the first two to three weeks, a necessary evil, unfortunately, but once you get over that hump, you'll stop hating me and start loving me because you're getting the results you've been searching for for so long. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols, and here you can watch the next video.